Hi, I'm Rich Miller. At Virtua, we believe citizens need to be informed about the important health care issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support health care programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Virtua, Wells Fargo, Caldwell University, the New Jersey Education Association, Suez, ready for the resource revolution, Johnson & Johnson, and by Kessler Foundation, changing the lives of people with disabilities. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got this? Man. Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Uh, public television is honored to welcome Mr. James Lipton, a Critics' Choice and Emmy Award winning creator, writer, host of Inside the Actors Studio and, and Dean Emeritus uh, Actors Studio Drama School at Pace. University, uh, let me welcome you on behalf of everyone in the world of public broadcasting, Mr. Lipton. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I need to ask you, first of all, thank you for bringing this blue card, which uh, <laughs> it doesn't make it official. I'm naked without it. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I've often, first of all, the idea that you are here is important to all of us and more importantly, important to our audience. The key or the keys to this series, which has been on the air for how long? We are in our 23rd season. Why has it worked, Mr. Lipton? It's worked for two odd reasons. Uh, when, we, when I was the dean of the Actors Studio Drama School, I created it with my colleagues at the Actors Studio. And when we began it, uh, we knew that we had teachers. All of our teachers are, are life members of the Actors Studio. We knew that it would be a very important graduate school. It gives an MFA. And uh, we were, we, we had teachers from the, from, uh, from the studio, people who could give us 30 weeks, people who could give us six Fridays and so forth. I had one opening and um, that opening was for those people who couldn't give us six weeks of teaching, but who were members of the studio, colleagues of ours, people from the industry with whom we'd worked, and whom we wanted to come and teach our students. It is a master class. And uh, so uh, I sent a letter out to the community from which I'd come, and uh, I said, these people are liable to say something important. Uh, and television is the only way to re mm. preserve it forever. And bravo to its eternal credit, I believe, uh, responded. You pitched the idea. Yes, I pitched the idea of both the school and the uh, television program to the studio and to the television industry. But would you like to know a wonderful secret? Sure. It links us forever with PBS. When we created the school, which was my idea, and I worked with Norman Mailer and uh, Paul Newman and Ellen Burstyn. I mean, we had a great committee that put the school together. We asked Charlie Rose if we could come on and announce the fact that the Actors Studio for the first time in then 47 years was going to create a degree granting program. Charlie invited us on the show and the there was a flood of applications within uh, three years. We were the largest graduate drama school in America, and we owe it to Charlie. And public television. And public you, television. You, that's announced, where we, on, you that, announced on public television. That's where we went. We knew, we were smart. We knew where to go. <sighs> you have done so many extraordinary interviews, and I'm gonna ask you this, because we're about to show a clip from one of your most uh, interesting students. Um, I know right? where this is going. Yeah, yeah, I know you know where it's going. In fact, let me show the clip and we'll come back. All right. Um, the setup. It doesn't need much setup. Bradley Cooper. 
as a student, asking a question as a student, and then I'm not going to say anything more than that because I don't want to give it away, okay, Mr. Lipton? Deal. Let's take a look at the clip. Poop. Yeah. How about you? Do you have a favorite classroom moment? I mean, do you really have to ask? There it is, folks. <laughs> How you doing, Mr. De Niro? My name is Bradley Cooper. Uh, my question is regarding awakenings. You talked about your research and how you, uh, you interviewed a lot of patients, people who had the different yeah. diseases. And there was one um, mannerism that you had during the interview process when they were asking you when you wanted to go outside the building, go for a walk. And you did, went like this with your finger and you'd sort of made up for it by rubbing your eyebrow. Right. And I was wondering, is that something that you would saw people do, sort of try to make up for their tics, or was that something that happened in the moment? But it's a good question. <laughs> Do I hear familiar voices? Yep. You, you know, for, for years and years and years, for decades, yes. I was asked, what guest in the whole world do you want the most? You know what my answer was? Go ahead. The night that one of our graduated students has achieved so much that he comes back to our stage and sits next to me as my guest, and Bradley was the one. What was that like for you, Mr. Lipton, when that moment happened and Robert De Niro walked out and your student Bradley Cooper is there. What yeah, was it like? Th that, that moment was from the 250th episode when he came back. But the first time that he came as a guest, as my guest, as, as me sitting with you. Sure. We looked at each other and we burst into tears and we had to stop and we cover ourselves before we could go on with the show. And he cried all through the show. He kept bursting into tears. He's a wonderful man. And a, as we all know now, is a brilliant actor. But I auditioned him. If I if I'd turned him down, he would have stayed at Georgetown and become a diplomat. <laughs> you know, it's so and a great one. I'm sure. But as you talk about this, what strikes me is the personal human connection that you feel to your students. Talk about it. Well, when I, I, I woke up one morning, 1994, with an idea in my head a complete idea, everything, down to the curriculum, down to the credits, down to the teachers. And I went to uh, Jonathan Fan, who was then the president of the New School for Social Research, where we began. And I said to him, what if I could uh, uh, persuade the studio to, for the first time in 47 years, teach a graduate degree granting program, and he said, where's the pen and when do I sign? And that's when those people worked with me, and that's when Charlie Rose invited us on, and that's how it started. So the school, I, 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 I was busy then writing my third musical for Broadway, uh, I, and I started to step aside. My colleagues at the studio said, you can't. You have yeah. to start this. You have to launch it. I said, okay, I'll do it for a year. I did it for 10 years. I was its dean, and uh, that school, I guess if I have a letter to the world, that school is it. And those students, I go to the repertory season each year when the graduating students show their wares, and I sit there in such awe and with such pride and with the deepest feeling. It is, I suppose, that's my letter to the world. You know, often when I sit in this seat, in this studio, yeah. at the Tisch, you know, WNET studio here in Lincoln Center, I often feel um, uh, blessed is a, is a word that's overused by a lot of people, but I do feel blessed. I feel incredibly fortunate, and this is a, uh, one of the reasons for it, to be able to talk to people, and more importantly, listen to people that's, like you. That's the key. How often do you feel like that? How often? Every time I walk on that stage. Look, if, if when we started this whole thing inside the actor's studio, uh, somebody had put a gun to my head and said, I'm going to pull the trigger unless you predict that in 22 years, it's still going strong, 
You will be viewed in 94 million homes in America on Bravo and 125 countries around the world. 125 countries around the world. That is correct. 94 million homes. That is correct. You, you will have, the show will have 18 Emmy nominations making Inside the Actors Studio the fifth most nominated show in the history of broadcast television. You will, the show will receive an Emmy Award for Outstanding Informational Series. You personally will receive the Critics' Choice Award for Best Host. 2015. Yes, that's correct. If, you, if somebody had said that to me, predicted or, or I pulled the trigger, I would have said, pull the trigger, I'm a dead man. I saw none of it coming. None of it. Not only that, but I made two vows to myself. One, that we would not deal in gossip, we would deal in craft, which of course I thought might make us dry and off the air in, in a year. And the other, that there would be no pre-interview. It is the only show of its kind that I know of where there's no pre-interview, none. That's why I do the blue cards. I spend. For each show, I spend two weeks at least, sometimes three or four, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, preparing those blue cards myself. Explain that. My Explain computer. that. For folks who understand, I want to really understand what Mr. Lichtman is saying. Um, and I'll disclose in, in our world, um, our, our producers do pre-interviews. That's right. Everybody look at the notes. I will look at the notes, and, and then I will decide what I want to do. But I probably couldn't do that. You're probably much smarter than I am. No, I probably would, would, would fail at that. That's not the case. You do all your research. You do it. I'm alone in my study, and I'm there for two weeks or three or four, watching every foot of film and, and, uh, and working on the blue cards, and then I churn them out, and then we go on stage. What I've compared it to and what the guests have sometimes compared it to is a kind of circus ring where there's a high wire with no net. We're out there for four or five hours. It's a master class for, for um, graduate students, and we're up there on that net, with, on that high wire, with no net. And, uh, and, and that's the way the show works. I did that with no pre-interview. I figured that would force us into a conversation. And we would have to do what you said a few minutes ago, which is the key to it all. We'd have to listen to each other, which is what actors do when they're acting well. And if the show has any secret, that's it. They don't know what's coming next. I don't know what's coming next. And that's the thrill of it. And I go on that stage with them, and you know the people that I've been on the stage with. It isn't, their, it isn't their celebrity that excites me. It's what might happen between us. And when things go awry, and all those 400 blue cards avail me nothing because they've gone off in a brand new direction, I'm the happiest man in New York. As you say that, Mr. Lippin, what, so, what strikes me is all that preparation and so many people who want to go into this business and think it's about the list of questions you have that makes a great interview. You just proved that is not the case. Oh, no. The questions are meant to evoke an answer, and the answer is what is everything. I, I actually am see, I edit the show myself with my colleagues. Uh, uh, Jeff Wirtz is the actual editor, the physical editor, but I do the, the, uh, the, the creative editing, and I edit myself out of that show. I'm on the screen less than any host in television, I think, for good reason, because there are people that are on yeah. that stage are, are saying things that really matter, and they're the reason that the people tune in all over the world. 125 countries. That's not a joke. When you interviewed Robin Williams, when you were with Robin Williams, oh. what was it? Go ahead. Well, Robin, he came out on the stage, and he suddenly began to dance around and carry on. And it was finally, after a, quite a length of time, I raised my hand. It was about seven or eight minutes. I raised my hand. He said, what do you want? I said, I want to ask a question. He was on his own, for, and then that, that went on for, it was, it was our first two-hour show, and we were, in the, we were in that theater on the stage for five hours that night, and he, every moment of it was sheer genius. The most famous moment on our show, yes. without question, was the pink pashmina that he took from a young woman in the first row, and he did about eight minutes on the pink pashmina, changing characters with it, turning into different people, and producing humor that was the equal of anything that anybody could see on television that year. Genius, genius. Speaking of genius, I, I'm almost embarrassed to do this. Can I, uh, the questions, the genius questions? All right, I, I have to do it. I don't have to, I choose to. Your questions, not mine. Can I flip the table? Can yeah. I turn the tables? Let me ask you a question. If I answer them, will you answer them? Oh boy. No, I can't. I can't. I can't do it because I, I, I'm no good at this. 
The whole. It, Don't worry about it. We'll do, we'll, What's your favorite word? Honor. What's your least favorite word? The N word. No matter who says it, and no matter what its purpose may seem to be these days, it is a word that was meant to injure, and no context makes it okay. What is the sound or noise you love? Silence. The most underestimated sound in the world. The sound or noise you hate? The din that passes for joy in restaurants and public places when people scream at each other or they think they're not having a good time. What profession, other than what you're doing today, would you like to attempt? I would like to be a premier danseur, but with this proviso, never old and never injured. Um, what profession would you not like to do, Mr. Lipton? That's easy. Executioner. And finally, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? See, Jim, you were wrong. I exist. But you may come in anyway. <laughs> um, this is public broadcasting. Um, I'm afraid to ask you if, if your favorite. Can I do the favorite curse word? No. You can. I can? You can ask me mine. I hear my... our president somewhere in the building. Can I ask him a favorite? Can we'll bleep it. Your favorite? No, my, mine is not. You won't have to bleep it. Favorite curse word. It's not, it's, it's, it's not obscene, and it's not, not scatological. It's profane. You can tell when I'm really upset. The first words out of my mouth are Jesus Christ. Mm. And that is objectionable to many people. And I apologize right mm -hmm. here and now for saying it. But nevertheless, that's my favorite curse word. I know that comes out because it comes out before I can stop it. What turns on, what turns off? What turns me on is words, not mine. But I think that words, in the, especially in the English language, are our most precious natural resource. What turns you off? Humiliation, especially toward a defenseless child. Yeah. Uh, do you mind if I tell people James Lipton? Mind? <laughs> well, I'm in your debt. Inside, Inside. That's my memoir published a few years ago. And that's my other letter to the world. That's an exaltation of larks, the book about collective nouns like a pride of lions and a gaggle of geese, Thank and you. all the real ones that I found and the ones I made up. Mr. Lipton, my producers who talk to me in my ear, you go without a net. My producers are insisting I ask the question. You want me to do this? Try. They want me to answer. You want me to answer the questions? Try it. Go ahead. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm going to try. I've, I've always been uncomfortable with this. Go ahead. What's your favorite word? Love. What's your least favorite word? Hate. What turns you on? My wife. What turns you off? Oh, oh boy. <laughs> My first answer, I'm not going with. I gotta go with the first. No, you don't. Um, um, bullying. What sound or noise do you love? Uh, Luther Vandross. <laughs> I always remember Ellen Burstyn's answer to that. It was birdsong in the morning and Rachmaninoff at night. What sound or noise do you hate? Yelling in our house. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> Not doing a uh, favorite curse word. Um, it is the, uh, it's that word. It's the F the, word. Yes, the F word. Yeah, it's uh, almost everybody's favorite. And then everyone on our staff knows, so I'm sorry. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Oh, I would always love to have played center field for the only baseball team that matters, the New York Yankees. And what profession would you not like to participate in? Anything that involves working with your hands. Finally, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I know you tried your best, Steve. Not bad at all. Thank you, Mr. Lipton. Very good answers. It's been an honor to have you with us. An honor to be here. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm so indebted to PBS. We're indebted to you. That's it, folks. We'll see you next time. Visit us online at steveautobato.org. Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're joined by Dennis Dunaway, founding member of the Alice Cooper Group and author of Snakes, Guillotines, Electric Chairs, My Adventures in the Alice 
Cooper Group. Good to have you with us, Dennis. Good to be here, Steve. Uh, I've got to ask you, uh, Alice Cooper Group, called the most dangerous band in the world, uh, one of the most famous groups, the school's out, and one of my favorites of all time. Describe this band. Well, basically, it was a, a bunch of high school teenagers that knew each other. And From Al where? Uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Alice and I met in 1962. I was a sophomore, and he was a freshman. We were both 16, and we met in art class, and he was the only kid that I could talk to about surrealistic art, you know, and uh, pop art and stuff, and, and we became friends over that, and then we ran cross-country on the cross-country team. We did journalism, so we learned how to promote our band, the Earwigs, who... The Earwigs? Yeah. That was the first... Band. Yeah, it was actually a spoof that we talked the Letterman's Club into. Uh, they had a talent show, and we talked them into letting us do a spoof on the Beatles. So we wore scuzzy Beatle wigs and called ourselves the Ear Wigs, and we were supposed to be from Cesspool, England. Oh, God. When, when did the, the... That's it. There the, we are. There you are. Yeah, the when, two nerds. The two nerds. <laughs> well, when did the two nerds come together and form the Alice Cooper band? Well, uh, first we became the Earwigs, and then we, we changed the name to the Spiders because we got the gig at the local popular hotspot in Phoenix at the time. Uh, we, we were the Spiders, and we had a stage uh, that we called the Spider Sanctum, mm -hmm. and it had a big spider web on the front, and we wore all black with turtlenecks, and we actually got a, a hit song called Don't Blow Your Mind. It went to number 11 in well, Tucson. This was 1966. I was just fresh out of high school. Alice was still in high school. And uh, so we were pretty popular throughout the Southwest as a garage band. When does it explode? Uh, well, I mean, that, that was, uh, you know, we were big fish in a little pond there. We migrated to LA and all of a sudden we had to start all over. So we went through a big transformation. We decided that uh, Alice and I started a group thinking, let's apply art, artistic ideas into a rock band. That was so it. we got very avant-garde when we landed in L.A. We got very psychedelic. We started wearing uh, chrome uh, clothing and, uh, and growing our hair out down to our waist. And, uh, and we struggled a lot because we lost all of our Spiders fans because they're like, who are these guys, you right. know? And... Then we changed our name to Alice Cooper, and that was the name of the band. But uh, still, that was uh, not too acceptable in those times. Not even in Hollywood. Where's the name? I would uh, the name. Yeah. Uh, well, it was Alice thinking in terms of like Lizzie Borden, you know, the innocent little girl <laughs> next door, or you know, the Alice bad Cooper. seed. Yeah, but she has a hatchet behind her back. You know, <laughs> uh, what would you give me for a basket of kisses? You know. Uh, so, uh, also it had to do with, uh, we, we had to drop the Spiders because another band came out with an album okay. called The Spiders. Then we changed it to what we thought nobody would ever have, the Naz. And we built ourselves as a Naz, and then uh, the, the, you know, Todd Rundgren's band, the Naz, came out. And so we thought, okay, we really have to come up with something nobody will ever have. So when you have the shock rock, yeah, def define it. Well, uh, we, uh, the first show that we actually did as the Earwigs when we actually could play instruments was a Halloween dance, 1965. And we had spider webs, we had a guillotine, we had tombstones and coffins and a guy with makeup that was like a ghoul. So we loved that. And uh, so uh, as we started to, to push the boundaries and starting to, started to bring dramatics into the stage show, uh, uh, we sort of started tapping that again. But it was really like, you know, Vincent Price horror films. Mm. Alice and I used to go to the drive-in, you know, to see Psycho or whatever, and, and we loved that. What made the band so special, in your opinion? What made it so special, Dennis? Uh, I just think that it was, uh, we delivered everything with this sinister attitude but it was really, and, and real fans could tell, it was really just a bunch of high school kids having fun. The band broke up what year? <clears throat> 1975. But you remain, you have a good relationship. We're good friends. How does we that were, happen? Uh, uh, I just saw Alice last weekend, and uh, we're writing songs together, Michael and Neil and Alice and I. So 
How does that happen? Yeah. Well, we started as friends. You know, the whole thing started as teenage friends that all went to high school together. And, and uh, when it came time where a lot of bands had the lawyers all in place and ready to fight over the name and everything, uh, we decided, you know what? We started as friends. Let's, let's keep it that way. So, so we- Friendship uh, more important than money. That, that's what we thought, and, and it you seems to be- You still believe that, don't you? I do, otherwise I wouldn't be hanging out with Alice, and, and he wouldn't be, we, you know, we get together and we have a lot of laughs. Same with Neil. Uh, Neil was the uh, drummer of the original group, and I married his sister, so we're very close as a rhythm section and as, you know, relatives, I guess. Mm. <laughs> and then Michael Bruce, a guitar player who wrote most of the hits, uh, we're, we're still good friends. We all, we all, everything had a sense of humor, even during our toughest times. You know, there was still a lot of laughs going on. Mm. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame meant one to you. Uh, that was the most wonderful day of my life. I mean, it was like... Uh, 2011? Uh, yes, 2011. What did it, mean to you? it was at the Waldorf Astoria what did here it mean? in New York. What does it mean? To you. To me? It means that uh, we weren't so crazy after all, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and especially to, we have so many fans, you know, and we have so many detractors all along, you know. There was a lot of people that just don't like us because of the name or the image or whatever. And it's great because it sort of validates that they weren't all crazy as well, you know, because uh, every fan that we have always tells us about how they're trying to talk their friends into listening to our music and everything and how it's, so tough and okay now it's like yeah 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 and you finally the group you still play with today is called blue coop it's with uh joe and albert bouchard who are famous because of blue oyster cult you know don't fear the reaper and burn it right. for you and all of that and uh we just have a lot of fun we met in 1972 when they opened for the alice cooper group and uh we get out and play a lot, and we also have background singers, the darlings of the demented, Tish and Snooky, who have Manic Panic, the hair dye company, and they're great singers, and uh, we, everywhere we go, we have all of the Blue Oyster Cult fans and the Alice Cooper fans show up, and we've kind of weeded out the people that, that don't like us. <laughs> i tell you what, more people should have your attitude about life and business and, and work, and... Uh the world will be a better place. I wish you nothing but the best. Do you mind if I tell everyone about your book again? Oh, please do. Uh, Dennis Dunaway. Um, it's called Snakes, Guillotines, Electric Chairs, My Adventures in the Alice Cooper Group. We wish you nothing but the best, and congratulations in being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio. Right? That's right. That's a big deal. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Stay Steve. Right there. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Virtua, Wells Fargo, Caldwell University, the New Jersey Education Association, Suez, Johnson & Johnson, and by Kessler Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.